Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Fontaine. I'm the operations coordinator at Okimo Valley TV, and I'm joined today by Tesha Bus. And um, Tesha, I'll let you introduce yourself. Great. I'm Tesha Bus. I am the state representative for the Windsor Five District, which is Plymouth, Reading, and Woodstock. Great. Yeah. So today, um, uh, Tesha is going to help me learn a little more about the state legislative um, House of Education Committee and just learn a little more about how that works um, at the state level and then how it how it all connects to our local towns um, here in the Windsor County. Um, so maybe starting just from like a bird's eye view. So what branch it starts with and then coming down into to what you do. Sure. So um, I'm a legislator, so it is the legislative branch which writes the laws. The governor is basically the the manager of the state. He enacts or she enacts all of the the laws and the legislation um, that is new as well as what is existing. And then there is the judicial branch, which determines um how the law is applied and if somebody uh, followed the the rule of law. So right now we're in the leg part of the legislative session called crossover, which means that all the bills um, that the House has been working on goes to the Senate and all the Senate bills go over to the House. Um, that is so we will be working on the budget this week. Um, we are uh, the, the governor recommends the budget. It comes down. It comes over to us. Um, the House works on it. Then the Senate works on it. And then if there is a, a conflict, uh, and usually there is with the budget, they go to what's called a committee of conference. And then they'll have some key people on both sides that work out the final details. Um, it is the House Ways and Means Committee that determines all revenue sources. And then the Senate decides whether or not they agree with them. They'll have to present, um, there's lots of different ways to raise revenue and the Senate kind of uh, has a, a bigger handle in deciding which one, but the House is the one that, um, the body that puts forth that type of information. So I sit on the House Education Committee and contrary to what I think a lot of people think the House Education Committee does, we don't really deal with curriculum. Um, that is a local decision that, um, that is, you know, all the supervisory unions have their own opinions about curriculum and they make their own choices for what type they want to buy. And that is also true for their budgets. Um, the, the state is supposed to raise the amount of money that all the local school boards tell us that we need to raise. We don't set a certain level of money and say, guys, you got to fit in this budget. So that can create excess spending. So we're definitely looking at um, a potential option to to adjust that. Um, but the challenge is that people like local control. So we will have um, some interesting times ahead to determine um, how we can maybe strike the right balance there. So in the Shumlin administration, the State Board of Education and the Secretary of Education, their role started to shift. Um, the Secretary used to serve at the pleasure of the State Board. Now the Secretary is an appointed political official. So Governor Scott just appointed a new Secretary of Education. She comes from Florida. She has extensive charter school background. Um, I think there are lots of uh, folks that are concerned about um, a state that is predominantly public education, and she's predominantly from a uh, not public education background. So that's a very, that's a statement in and of itself with just her appointment. Um, we've, we're looking at um, funding education overall and looking at different funding models. And in doing so, uh, we also see that private education can be more expensive. So uh, we'll have to figure out how that all will work together. Um, the state board is a mix of private and public school advocates. The percentages do not match our school population. We have about 4% of our population is um, in private education. 
um, with the rest of public education. So the state board is a little bit, uh, that makeup is not reflected in those appointees. And right now, um, because Governor Scott's been in office for so long, most of those appointees have been his, whereas in other uh, times, like people always talk about, is it good to have a governor in office for a long time? That would be an example of uh, a good, a potentially good or bad choice. And I'm not, I'm not um, here to uh, say which is the other, but that is um, the fallout of someone uh, being in office for a long time is that the appointees become all from that person. And that happens a throughout many, many, many branches of um, state governments and boards that uh, advise on a lot of different levels or make lots of choices. The state board's responsible for all rulemaking in education. Um, the secretary of education manages all of the ins and outs, how we draw title funds down from the federal government to pay for special education um, modules for teachers when they want to increase their professional development. They do not, however, go into the school system and provide any coaching on how to implement those modules. So it's basically, it's teaching. Um, so you get the class, but you don't get any practicum along with it. And it is frequently the practicum that is um, most important and most beneficial to what it is that we learn is how do we get it into the to the classroom, particularly if we've been teaching a totally different method for 20 years. You know, it's can't teach old dogs new tricks. And um, we as humans are not very dissimilar sometimes. So that is the basic gist of where we are and the branches and um, how the house education works. Um, uh I am happy to go through a few bills that we have passed out of the house in the last couple of weeks. Okay, yeah, if you'd like to share uh, what's been going on, that'd be great. Okay, wonderful. So I think what I'm I'm most proud about our healthcare bills. We have, ex um, we've done a lot of work with prior authorizations. We had heard that um, UVM Medical Center has around 70 employees that only work with prior authorizations. So the bill put forth says that Vermont's Medicaid has this coding system for all of the different procedures. But the issue is, is that every insurance company has their own coding system and it can get really, really confusing. There are lots of people who need a procedure and they're set, they're told, well, you know, you don't have this disease, so you don't need this procedure. And then they would say, well, but the doctor thinks I have this disease, so they wanted to get me this test. And they're like, well, you can't because you don't have it. And we're like, we know that. And then we go in this circle. Um, and so basically that's what we're trying to do, um, make sure that everybody gets the health care that they, that they need and that these, we don't need a bunch of bureaucracy. We don't need tons of different coding. We need um, to the best of everyone's ability, one set, and then we don't have to be confused. Um, we are also increasing colorectal screenings down to age 45 instead of 50. And when you go to get a mammogram, you your first screening is covered. But if they find a spot on the breast, then you usually have to go back and they'll take another um, they'll take another image before they'll go to the biopsy. And then sometimes at the biopsy, they take a third one. Well, after the first one, the patient's responsible for all of the others. And so this legislation assists in getting more of that covered because it's still a part of the diagnosis um, sector and not treatment because you're not in treatment yet because you don't even know what you have yet. Um, we, have, uh, we did pass uh, S18, which is a ban on flavored tobaccos with tobacco products and menthol cigarettes, which is in keeping with New York state's policy. Um, now, you know, this was a challenging one from a financial perspective because we do take in about 14 million in tax revenue annually, but we are also paying out around 400 in tobacco related medical care. And so, um, 
that was a very robust five hour floor debate um, over, over e-cigarettes. Uh, we have two education bills that are coming to the floor this week, uh, which I'm very excited about. One is to do, it'll, it'll be one more year of strong work on the school construction aid package. And then the other bill creates a method that will enable supervisory unions to create board of cooperative education services. And that means that we will be able to operate more at scale. We're such a rural state. We go in, we're, you know, one small school district and we've got four elementary schools, a junior high and high school, and we want to do professional development and the science of reading. And that's going to cost a certain amount of money. But if we can partner with two or three other supervisory unions, then that price tag is going to go down. We have um, occasionally a teacher that we will need for just 20 hours a week. And we have to provide that class to our students. And we are going to have to hire them for 40 hours a week because we have to have them and they need a 40 hour a week job. And that's, that's it. So we have to eat that money and, and find other things for them to do in a collaborative. We can go to the supervisory union next door, who's probably also needing the same service for 20 hours a week, and then start to begin to um, share some of these services. And, and some of this are, you know, we're not talking like, you know, math and science and reading. Those are mostly, mostly for the arts or um, foreign languages and such. So um, very excited about that bill. We did pass out the renewable energy standard. You know, a huge part of the price tag to the renewable energy standard is to upgrade our electrical transmission lines, which not only needs to happen because we are more people are using more electricity these days um, and they're using less fossil fuel um, driven products in a traditional sense. Well, you know, I do know that natural gas um, is a way that we create electricity here. So I don't I don't want to confuse those things. Um, and we've had so, so many power outages. And the only way to make our grid more resilient is to do some upgrades. So we have to figure out how to pay for those, which is what this renewable energy standard bill um, works on, as well as our contract with Hydro Quebec is going to end in 2036. And they have definitely indicated that they may have to pull back on the amount of power that they are able to sell to Vermont. And in the course of that, we do not, you know, we don't drill for oil here. Um, we don't have any way to produce fossil fuels. So the way for us to compete in terms of um, being able to provide some of our own utility, our own power is in the renewable energy sector. So um, that is, you know, wind and uh, some hydro will be potentially considered. It has to meet certain standards and then solar. Um, and then we will continue as always to look at alternative forms of creating energy that will um, come online in the future. I read a lot about energy work. Um, it's really an exciting topic for me, and um, we have a lot of work to do. And I'm I'm excited to see where where we can go in the energy uh, field. So that is the the basic gist of some of the things that we've passed. Wow. All right. Um, you know, it, it's interesting to me how specific <laughs> each of these things are. Um, it's like when you're talking about um, the the Medicaid um, and just like being able to pay for not just the first, but the second and third um, appointments. And um, yeah, it's interesting. Like it must be exciting when something comes on to your plate that's like so specific on something that, you know, you might be more passionate about um, and being able to feel like you're making like a real difference in um, like a specific person's life. And it's really, that's really neat, neat work that you get to do. Um, Thank you. 
some days are easier than others. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, I wonder if uh, you could maybe describe for me just like what kind of a average day might look like for you, like what your schedule might be. Um, at the, do you work mostly at the state house? Is that kind of where you're at most of the season? So our legislative session begins in January, the very first week of January, and it goes until usually the second week in May. So this year, that'll be May 10th. That is when we actually just, we we show up uh, Tuesday through Friday, you know, we get paid. A lot of people stay overnight. Um, you know, we get some meals and room stipend because some people, you know, if you live in Bennington, you're not going to commute to and from Montpelier every day. Um, I I can do both, but this is the time of year where, you know, like last week, uh, you know, we had 12 to 14 hour days almost every day. So that is a little harder to commute and make sure that you are fresh to hear <clears throat> testimony in your committee for a certain amount of time. You know, most days we'll do testimony from nine to noon, take a lunch break, and then you're on the floor at one o'clock. A lot of times we haven't left that floor until you know, seven, eight, nine, 30, 10 o'clock at night. So that's very much a, a marathon there. Then the rest of the year, I think people think that we're completely off, but we're never fully off. Um, we're always answering constituent emails and helping constituents find resources. You know, if you're, <clears throat> we've had a lot of calls about like, why can't I get through to the Vermont Department of Labor um, to do my unemployment filing? Um, and that, that, that department is in quite a, a mess these days. They're working on it. Um, so that is one thing. And then every year our bills are due. So all the time that we spend talking to our municipalities or our regional planning commissions and all of our constituents about what concerns them and what bills that we should write to help solve some of the issues all of that's on our own accord. We don't get paid for that. That's our own research time. Um, we might spend 200 hours uh, on researching Act 250 um, only to go in, present the bill, and the committee doesn't want to talk about it. And then they don't. Um, so it's very, very fascinating. That's where like the political capital uh, thing um, comes into being. You really have to prove not only that you are intelligent and that you can put forth good bills, but you have to work really well with others and be able to um, compromise and communicate really consistently and effectively. Um, and it's a part of the job that I, I very much enjoy, um, but it is an exceptional amount of work. Um, a lot of times there are meetings, you know, late at night, even after the, the day that you have to attend to and the balance of that with a family um that is that is definitely the hardest part of the job yeah wow well it sounds like um it's a very like full um job and it and it, and it sounds like it it can also be um challenging at times but reward rewarding at other times when you can finally see all the hard work coming to fruition <laughs> Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, well, this has been great. Thank you so much for, for filling me in on things that have been passed and, uh, a little more about just sort of the general day in the life. And this has been really in informational for me. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, all right. Um, I think that is, that's all I have. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we sign off? No, I think we're good. And I think I'll see you again or uh, Patrick or Tom in about two weeks. Yes. All right. That sounds great. Looking forward okay. to hearing more about what's been going on in two weeks. Great. Thanks so much. Right. Thank you.